All right, quick review a little bit. Uh, John, we're with John chapter 13 tonight. Uh, chapter 12 ends the public ministry work of John uh, when he's writing. You got 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, where you're dealing more with the, just the apostles. So that's that's where we are with that. Uh, 13 is there's a little controversy about exactly when it's going. Let me, let me talk to this right quick and just not get in deep into it. But we normally look at the supper where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, the Passover thing being on Thursday night, the trail on Thursday night, the trials. And he dies on Friday and is raised on Sunday. There are a lot of the scholars who push it for it to be on Wednesday. So we said there, there's nothing recorded that we know of that happened on Wednesday. We're not talking about the events that went on during the week. Nothing happened on Wednesday. A lot of them will back it up and have this supper happen on Wednesday night and the crucifixion on Thursday. That way you get Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night, three nights in the tomb. Otherwise, you only have two nights in the tomb. So there's a lot of arguments and discussions back and forth about that. So something you've got to think about on your own and figure out what you want. We'll, we'll get to it later on. I've got a couple of charts that show some of the different ideas about it. But anyhow, when I say here it's the night, but it's before the Passover. That's the text says that. So is it the night before the Passover, or is it just the day when they're getting ready for the Passover? Uh, whatever. So that's that's one of the slides here with that controversy. <laughs> they're mentioned in that so it's on wednesday night or thursday night we generally look at it being on thursday night and the supper and the prayer in the garden the betrayal and all that stuff and then during the night the trials next morning and they died on friday so okay we got one point here says the devil's already entered in Judas's heart to betray jesus well hit that again tonight so you got to one comment here about it, and we get another comment in the list tonight about it. Uh, they're talking about who's greatest in the kingdom. We'll hit that again tonight. The mount, where it's generally thought that the upper room was for the uh, supper over here. Of course, question mark, question mark. Nobody knows, I guess, for sure about that. Uh, temple, and then the room for that. So just washes their feet. The master, the big thing we talked about last time, the master washing the feet of the servants as opposed to the lowly servant washing the feet about the opposite of what you would want to think about it he's trying to teach him a lesson and he said you've allowed what i've done for you and he wants them to do that for them others and we talked about humility and service you know all through the class last time uh if you know these things that's all right if you do them uh you know what i've done for you he wants them to understand you know, I, I've, I've showed you this. Do you understand what I've showed you? Do you understand what I want you to do? Do you understand how I want you to use this? Uh, and so you should do as what I've done to you. Taking the form of a servant, Jesus did when he came. He was the master. He's the king. But he took the form of a servant to show them what it meant to be on to do that. So get in tonight. We're in chapter 13 and verse 18. We pick up, and it's also Mark 14. Verse 18. So John 13, verse 18, Mark 14, verse 18. That's what it is. So there's uh we're gonna have a lesson later on that goes through a bunch of prophecies that are fulfilled in this last week. And this is we're gonna mention like two of them tonight. This is one of them. Uh comes from Psalms 41, where it says, Yes, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate bread with me, has lifted up his heel against me. The prophecy from Psalm 41, of course, talking about Judas, the one who eats with me will betray me there. So the, all the when Jesus tells them this, all of them will start saying, you know, not I. And I go to Southern English, we say, is it me? You know, type thing. Uh, the NIV says, uh, surely not I. Like, I don't know, they're all doubting, not, not me. You know, I'm not the one that's going to do this. So, John actually motions for Peter, apparently, no, Peter motions to John, get it backwards here. Apparently John was, remember the picture we show with them laying down on their, on their elbow and eating. So John, he says he leaned back on his breast. He leaned back to Jesus and asked him who it was then. Uh, that Jesus said, whoever I, I dip and give the bread to, uh, one, the little difference in the, trans, in the different 
Gospels, one says the one who dips with me in the bowl, the one says the one who I dip and give it to there. So he does that though. And again it said now, Satan entered into Jesus. We already had that in the last week lesson was mentioned, and that comes in again. Uh, so Jesus tells him what you're about to do, do quickly. The other apostles don't really know what's going on. I don't know if I have on the slide or not. Yeah, they don't understand. Judas had the money bag, so that Jesus telling him to go out and do something with the money, give it to the poor, some of the poor, go buy more supplies for the, for the feast, or what? So he's, he's going at that. So Jesus has now told them about the betrayal. He's told them over and over and over, and we talked about it several times, going way back, that's how he's going to die. And they, they haven't, haven't gotten it, haven't gotten it yet. Uh, so how's he going to be the Messiah? How's he going to be the king in this kingdom? And yet, how's he going to die? They, they, they have a hard time, and, and you can understand this, putting all that together as to how this is going to happen. They can't imagine you know, him being raised necessarily. Now, they've seen Lazarus. That should be a little maybe example to them, that. So they're definitely confused about it. And now, on top of that, not only am I going to die, I'm going to be the king in the kingdom, but now one of my innermost circle here, my 12 apostles, one of you is going to betray me. So you can see what they're kind of in their mind going through as they, as they deal with this. Peter wouldn't have it. You know, Peter just, Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show the disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and the scribes, be killed, be raised the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter rebuking Jesus and saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. So they, they, just, they can't understand you know, he's going to die and then that uh, reaction to it there. Jesus told them, to, I'm telling you this ahead of time so that when it happens, you'll, you'll know that I am. He used the word he, I am he. I am, you'll understand I'm the Messiah. By me telling you ahead of time what's going to happen to me, and then when you see it happen, you'll understand who I am. Uh, Johnny George was reviewing my slides a good while back, and he made this note. So Jesus told them beforehand, so when it happened, they would know he was the Son of God. Chapter 13, verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know who I have chosen. The scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So that's why he's telling them this. Now, hold that thought just for a minute. I'm going to read a little bit, about four or five verses from Ezekiel chapter 6. This is God telling them through Ezekiel the prophet what's going to happen to them, the children of Israel, because of what they've done. I want you to listen how many times it says, you're going to know I'm the Lord when this happens. So this is Ezekiel 6, verses, starting in verse 10. And they shall know that I'm the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would bring this calamity upon them. Thus saith the Lord God, pound your fists, stomp your feet, and say, alas, all the evil abomination of the house of Israel. They shall fall by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. He who is far off shall die by pestilence. He who is near shall fall by the sword. He who remains and is besieged shall die in famine. Thus I will spend my fury on them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When they're slain or among their idols all around the altars, on every high hill, on the mountaintops, on every green tree, under every thick oak, whatever they offered sweet incense to all their idols, so I will stretch out my hand against them, make the land desolate, yes, more desolate than the wilderness of toward Debal and all their dwelling places. Then they shall know that I'm the Lord. So God was telling them, this is what's going to happen to you when Jerusalem is besieged and falls, and you're going to know that I'm the Lord when it happens. Same type of thing Jesus is doing here. That's the point. That I'm telling you this ahead of time so you'll know what it does. He's trying to build their faith that, yes, I told you this, and it happens. Okay? Then he talks about the same thing he's already told the Jews, Jewish leaders earlier back when he was in the temple, that is, I'm going to go away and you can't come with me. Because that, that confused them, of course. Well, where are you going that we can go with you? Well, he's going to the grave. Okay. I think you can't come with me. 
and then you're going to heaven and you can't come with me. So another prophecy here, this time from Zechariah 13, verse 7, where it says, Awake sword against my shepherd and against the man who's close to me, says Yahweh of the armies. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. So it's telling them, all of you are going to be scattered. I'm going, I'm going to be go where you can't go, and when I go, you're going to all be scattered. You're going to go different directions here. Peter protested again. No, not going to happen. No. Nope. So he tells him, Simon, I prayed for you. I tell Jesus, look in the eye and say, Carla, I pray for you. you know, this is going to happen. And when you recovered, when you get past what you're going to do, which is talking about the denying him three times. Now, stop a minute. If this is on the night of Jesus' betrayal, be it Wednesday night or Thursday night, they're having the supper. What did Jesus tell Peter? Before the cock crows again, you will deny me three times. So this is some time, let's say on Thursday night, after they've had the supper, they're going to leave, go out to the garden, the prayer, the betrayal, they take him away, and Peter denies him before sunrise the next morning. That's how close it is. So much you see the timeline here, what's going to happen. Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. But when you recover from it, strengthen or establish your fellow disciples, strengthen, strengthen your brethren, he tells him. Okay, thoughts before I take off and go again? Yes. All right, now he tells them a, it's a new commandment. He says, you see me that you can't come. I've got a new commandment for you. Love one another as I have loved you. And you stop thinking, well, wait a minute. What's new about that? I mean, we go all the way back to Leviticus 18 and what it's, what it said, love your neighbors yourself. Okay. Uh, remember when Jesus was asked what the two greatest commandments were? You know, love the Lord. And the second one was like into it, love your neighbors yourself. So what's new about, you know, love one another as I have loved you? What, what, what's, what's the new part? What makes this new? Well, I believe it's the last part. As I have loved you. Why? What's this to happen? You're going to die for them, for all of us, but for them. He's telling me the point. And, and you just got to keep this in mind as we go through chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, those in here. He's talking to the, it'll be the 11 after Judas is gone now. He's talking to them. And some of the things he's going to tell them is going to apply just to them. We'll try to point out some of those. We've got to figure out what in those chapters would just apply to them. Like when he says in like, chapter 15, you I've chosen. Well, that, that's them he's talking about. That way. Maybe in this chapter. i got I got three classes going on this week. And I, I'm once in chapter 15, once in this in chapter 13. And I'm getting flip-flopped as which one's which. But Love one another as I have loved you. The new part of it. He's going to lay down his life for them. So what you want to do? I want you to love each other enough to do what? To lay down your life for each other. The middle part of chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, is all about loving one another. And we'll get to that a little later on. But here he's talking about it here. So you're going to get it several times in these, in these chapters when he's talking just to, the, to these apostles here. Love one another as I have loved you. W. Vine says it's not new in a relationship to time. It's a new relationship to the quality, form, and nature of the love that he's got there. He laid out his life for his friends. I want to read three or four passages from 1 John. So here he's talking to the apostles, but the same thing John writes again when he writes his, his epistle to 1 John. 
got the same almost things in it. And there's no doubt about this applying to us. He who loves his brother abides in the light. And there's no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, does not know where he's going because the darkness blinded his eyes. Chapter 3, verse 14. We know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He does not love his brother, abides in death. Chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He does not love to not go to God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son to the world. We might live through him, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Now in verse, chapter 4, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Who does not love his brother, whom he's seen, how he loved God, who he's not seen. This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. So it's over and over and over. John writes about loving your brother. So Jesus here says, I got a new commandment for you. Not just love your neighbor as yourself. Love him as I have loved you. New point there. So, verse 35 here, by all this, all these, by this will all men know that you're my disciples. What? By the fact you're willing to lay down your life for one another. You're that close. You love each other that much that I'll lay down my life for you. Now, I like you a whole lot, but that's going a long ways with it. I'm willing to die for you. Think about that. Again, Peter says, I'll never leave you. You get a point here. If you talk to the kids, you might think about making rash statements. I'll never leave you, Peter says. Okay. Be careful about that. That's when he tells you we're going to deny him three times. This, this point in the chapter. Uh, I pray for you that your faith should not fail. Don't want to fail. When you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. He said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you deny me three times. We talked about that a little bit earlier. So within hours, it's going to happen. Within hours, he'll be denying him three times. So we think about this. Let him who thinks he stands, Peter or Wayne or whoever, you think you're standing, be careful lest you fall. Don't get too boastful, too proud. Now, it wasn't this Peter. So said all the disciples. All those with him there said something Peter did. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. But what's going to happen when the shepherd dies? The sheep are all scattered. Now, the very next thing he goes to, and we don't get to it tonight, very next thing. Think about what's going on here. You're going to deny me. You're going to be scattered. You're going to leave me. I'm going to die. That's the end of chapter 13. What's the first verse of chapter 14? There's no chapter breaks. Do not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So he tries to relax them a little bit, seems like, when he leads into chapter 14. We think about the chapter break now. Okay, that's that, and this is so. Think about it, the continuity there. He's been, he's, he's told them some pretty rough things that's going to happen. I'm going to leave you. You're going to forsake me. You're going to deny me. And then he comes back with, with this, John 14. Okay, that's kind of the end of this section. We're going to jump into something kind of totally different now. Well, you got your mask on, the microphone's on, yes, so don't speak up to you. Thoughts from anybody before we take off again? In a little different angle. It's interesting that the disciples um, had to be reminded. It made us think that they weren't having to be reminded and that they were still faltering, yeah. even at this time. Well, three years with him, yeah. Right, and I think that's an interesting contrast to bring up to 
children. You know, that's why you cite the word of God on your heart. That's why you have to be in the word. Increase our, increase our faith. They need for the disciples. And they were still struggling. Yep. Yep. And they had physically seen all the miracles he had done. Yep. Okay. Says, sure. Says essentially, die for each other. Yeah. We can't even talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, obviously, you know, and, and problems or whatever arise. And, you know, hey, I get my feelings hurt, you know, from a, from a brother or sister. Would I die for them if I'm that sensitive about things? Would I throw myself in front of that bus for them or whatever the case is? Um, I don't know. I think, I think, you know, thinking about that and putting it in context of, you know, kind of problems that 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 I have, you know, with with, with somebody or whatever. I would never die for them if that's not a a, a better relationship. Let me throw this out. It's kind of hit me. Is it would it be easier to do something big for somebody like I don't mean yeah let's say die for them. We don't know. We never had to do that. It would be easier to, to, to do something big for somebody than at least to solve a little bit of problems. No. Do we let a little bit of problems get there? We're fooling food? ourselves if we think we're going to throw ourselves across the bus. Yeah, if, if you don't do the other part. If we won't just look, overlook, you know, you know the, the thing or, or have the conversation, you know, about something that we need to resolve, or we're fooling ourselves, I think. Thoughts? Anybody? That's why I read this stuff from, from First John. I mean, it's not just them. This is all of us. And that's a hard thing sometimes for us to do. To, we read it, but we don't do it sometimes. Okay, let's change paths here. Anybody know what this is? Make a memorial, okay? A memorial to the president. You know what this is? If I get a system, I'm going to hand you some money, okay? The bow weevil, yep, Enterprise, Alabama. It's a memorial to the bow weevil. You know why? Bow weevil came in and ate up their cotton crops, and they couldn't get rid of it, so they all changed over to peanuts and started growing peanuts in southeast Alabama and, of course, south Georgia, and where most of the peanuts in this country are grown, thanks to the bow weevil. So it's, a, it's right in the middle of an intersection in Enterprise, Alabama, the bow weevil. You may not remember this one. When I first made it, it was pretty fresh. This is Saddam Hussein. They toppled him over. Memorials go, go down. Okay. Sometime. How about this one? We're in Matthew 26. It's also in Mark 14 now. They were eating this Passover supper the same Thursday night. We're assuming Thursday night. We'll talk about that other part later. As they finished the supper, Jesus took the bread and he, one gospel says he gave thanks, the other one said he blessed it. He gives it to them to eat. And he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup gave thanks, gave it to him, said, all of you drink from it, and drink from it, and this is my blood, the new covenant, new covenant. They don't know it yet, they don't understand it yet, that the old one's going away, okay? Takes all the way to Acts 15, maybe, to get it through their heads, and I'm not sure all of them got it then, okay, when we had the circumcision discussion. The old one's going away, a new covenant, which is shed for remission of sins. A different kind of memorial. Not one in stone. Not one that's going to topple over. Different kind of memorial. I have one note to that. Not one that can exist under a tree in Zimbabwe. It can exist in its deep to in a home. Whatever is defined as the church. One of the things that's really amazing about New Testament worship is there's nothing to purchase. 
I mean, there's no, you don't have to have any kind of big elaborate building or temple or gold or anything, right? You just need a place for where the church is defined at that area to come together. And the memorial that you come together for is something very simplistic. Very simple. You need water for baptism. And you need... And not much. Look at all the pictures we got from Zim. Yeah. They sat down and, you know, it's not like the deep water. But yeah, that and then just a simple memorial. Nothing costly. So, I mean, y'all may have heard this point made about others well, were made in the past. Jesus told them with the cup, "This is the blood which is shed for many, for the remission of sins." That's four there. It's the same four. I don't know Greek. I understand. Didn't totally understand this. The same four that's used in Acts 38. Okay? Same word. Now, how do lots of religious groups look at Acts 38? When are sins forgiven? When I accept Christ? When I prayed? Whatever. If the four in that place there doesn't mean baptized for the mission of sins, then how does the four down here where Christ died be for the mission of sins? If Christ is dying for the mission of sins, we are baptized for the mission of sins. Same word. I hate to keep going down, but no. also, there's also a lot that will say that four means because of. Yeah, right. And yeah. But if you put because of down there, that's because the whole point, yeah. You can't take it because of up here and stick it because of down here. Christ didn't die because sins were already remitted. He didn't die because, and sins weren't remitted because of animal sacrifices. You, you got to plug the same words in both places. Same words. So somebody's talking to somebody sometime, talk Acts 2 38, they got a problem with that, like Tracy's talking about here. Look back to Matthew 26 26. And look at the four there. Yeah, when he's doing the supper. Okay. All right. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9. All right. A couple of thought questions. We've got 10 minutes left here. How do we know that we are to eat the Lord's Supper? Jesus instituted it. Where is it? Where do we get the idea that we do it to follow up on it? Well, I'll give you a couple of things to think about. Matthew 28, when he gave the Great Commission, go make disciples of all nations. Let's say verse 20. Teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. So he told the disciples and the apostles here, to do this in remembrance of me. He told them in Matthew 28, 20, to teach those they convert, they make disciples of, to do the things he commanded them to do. To the Italian? Okay, so that's one, one thought you can use for that. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, says, I received from the Lord, verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. Jesus the same night took bread, and they come down to verse 25. He says, this do as often as you drink it. That's another place you can use to see that, that we do this. Okay. Something to think about. Why do we use the phrase, gather around the table? As we gather around the table. Well, we don't gather around our table now. It's moved out of the way, so we don't gather around it too much. Okay. Where do, where the phrase come from? As we gather around the table. We use quite a bit. I know one congregation that moved their table to the back of the building. Just get the people away from this, looking at the, at the table as something being something special. First Corinthians 10, the chapter before Paul writes what he did about the supper. That you cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Same ideas expressed there. The phrase table of the Lord has an impact terminology of the Lord. So we frequently refer to it as the table of the Lord or the Lord's table. So we gather around 
the table. So Paul referenced that here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So one place that phrase may have come from there. All right, one more thought question. Somebody got one of the, you got the book. Question three, can you read it? It's a fact Jesus took bread and he gave thanks for it. Is that a binding example for us to do it today? You ever thought about that? Or we just do it because we've always done it that way. The reason I'm, I got the, I'm asking these questions, and some of our discussions in this new curriculum stuff we've been working on, I don't know where it, where it came up, but the point was made that we need to challenge, I think it was particularly with the junior high, senior high, maybe where this came up, we need to challenge our students to think. Don't just give them a little fill in the blank type questions or something. Get them to think about stuff. So we give thanks for the bread, we give thanks for the juice, why? It's because we've always done it that way. So is Jesus, is Jesus' example of doing it here? Is that a binding example for us? We'll go back to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11. You might use that to think about with it. But you're, 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 our children are going to be challenged with things like this, not that one particularly, but things beyond just a little simple things in their life. There'll be challenges come up where their, their faith is challenged on various points. So as you get to your classes, whatever age you got, if, if they're appropriate, you know, get them to think about what's going on. That's my next question then. You got your children in your classes, okay? They need to start understanding what we're doing and why. So how will you teach? If I've asked this question too many times now here. Listen, how are you going to teach about the Lord's Supper, the importance of it, and what mom and daddy are doing? How are you going to teach that to your children? I know it's based on the grade level you got, but what's your approach going to be? I think you have to define what a covenant is for them, too. That's a strange word that they don't use very much. I remember Bob was really big on making sure people understood what that was when it came to that. I think you have to start by defining what that is for them. Yeah. And by the way, this point here comes right from your lesson book there, lesson 10 in both the readers and non-readers book is uh, use a worksheet to discuss the significance of Lord's Supper. So that's in your little teacher book that you got there to go with. It's a talk to your students about the importance of Lord's Supper and what it is and what it means. Now I know you got, again, I keep saying you got age differences you got to think about. Do you think you get in that different age groups back to your question about um you know you get to challenge them to think about why or you know when you deep reflect it for example i mean in, in race is just an incorrect way to think about it but i think people challenge things that are just simply um simplistically stated jesus blessed the bread why would you challenge not blessing the bread? I mean, to me, that's a question of your heart. I mean, there's some of that that I think we have to start understanding and unwinding. It's okay to, to challenge them to think through that if they're going to be challenged, but I think there's a piece that you also have to say, why is somebody challenging what Jesus himself did? I mean, you have to start asking those kinds of questions. Now, let me put that, that question in there is to get to think about is it tradition that we have always done it, okay? And that's the way I was brought up. That's what I've seen all my life. Versus, why did Jesus do that? And what example is he leaving for me? What did Paul talk about in 1 Corinthians 11? He reminded us of in 1 Corinthians 11 that Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. Okay? So I'm trying to, I was trying to separate with that question, the idea of, well, we just always have, Okay? Versus the, why we always have. Well, because that's the way Jesus did it when he set it up. That's what Paul talked about it. But we do it because of a reason. Okay, not just the routine type things that we do. Okay. 
take the covenant in and also teaching that even though these are physical emblems, that they they represent the spiritual, right? That whole concept of physical to spiritual and understanding throughout the scriptures, you know, we're given lots of those types of contrasts from physical to spiritual and um, how that binds us, how that acts. And it's also an act, how that, it's an, it's an, it's an act. You're showing God your remembrance of what he's done for you. You have to contrast that. Your boys, for example, are old enough to know what a tombstone is at a graveyard, right? Mm -hmm. And what's there. That's easy to relate that to this. Okay, that was there to remember. But you know what? In about four generations, Michael looked at that tombstone. 2,000 years, we're still doing the Lord's Supper. For the little ones, they can even If you pray with your kids on on Friday on Saturday night, mm -hmm. put that in there. Yeah. You know, that we'll be alert and ready, prepared for remembering your son tomorrow. And it, I think you get a key point there that if I don't understand anything else, I understand this is a, it's a, a quiet time. It's a time for me to sit there and be real still and really quiet. Because this is something special that mom and dad need to be thinking about. And as they get older, that can spur questions. Why is this? Why am I mentioning your flag? Why is that a different time? They should be able to almost feel it that it's there's something different at a little age about that time. Yeah. But to make that, we gotta act like it's different. We're I involved. Had one of my kids asked me was Are you did you just get aggravated at me because I was uh, I was you know, asked you a question so I was noisy. And I said, Well that's part of it. Well, you have, they really don't understand no. unless you tell them. Like, I really get irritated if my, you know, and kids just do that, right? I have really gotten in the car after worship and I've just, we've had to have an entire conversation about it all the way home. You know, that that is, I'm, you know, I'm reflecting on the sacrifice and the resurrection. You're, you, you know, you have to explain that and that it's a serious moment. It's a, reflective moment. I mean, they have to understand that. And if you interrupt that, you're interrupting that. <laughs> just, yeah. You know. So this, the, the, the big thing, the little ones to start, just, just, just be quiet. If something special during this time, just sit there and let mom and dad be quiet. And then you can build, like Tammy says, you can build on it yeah. from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's five o'clock. You can hear right there. Has Steve stopped yet? Time-wise, it says it's about that right. 